Greetings and welcome to chapter 5. Um, we're beginning uh, part 2, so we have finished uh, part 1, laying foundation, when we covered the first four chapters. And so now we're really uh, digging a little deeper here with part 2, acquiring tools. Uh, there'll be four chapters of part 2, this one, trading internationally. Part, uh, chapter 6 will be about uh, investing abroad directly, so that's going to be a lot of FDI. Uh, chapter 7 is about foreign exchange, and chapter 8 will be about uh, regional integration. So again, we're, we're digging a little bit deeper here with part 2. Uh, again, as always, please make sure you read the chapter. Uh, as we do this, preferably I'd like you to read it before you look at the slides, or at least familiarize yourself. But there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of content here, so let's get started. So first, the learning outcomes for this chapter. Uh, we'll use the resource-based and institution-based views to explain why nations trade. So that's, that's how we begin this entire chapter. Do we need to trade? Why we need to trade? How does it work? Uh, and then uh, again, identify and define the classical and modern theories of trade. This is where it gets really interesting uh, in terms of uh, what are the trade theories, again, split into two areas. Uh, the importance of political realities governing uh, international trade, uh, the factors that should be considered when your firm participates in international trade. So that's those are just the four uh, learning outcomes. Um, let's get started. Uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, bring to light the opening case. Again, I, I, I really want to make sure you read those. Uh, they're great. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, why are U.S. exports so competitive? And so the first thing is, you know, okay, well, a lot of, you know, you, you will hear, uh, especially, you know, in 2020 here this year, uh, we're in an you know, election uh, period, and so you will often hear um, political candidates from all sides uh, proclaiming that we just don't make stuff anymore. And so, I, I, you know, a lot of people are under the, the misguided impression that it's true, we don't make stuff, and how, how can you measure whether or not we quote-unquote make stuff? So we know that when you look at the GDP of the United States, uh, over three-quarters of the GDP, uh, more than almost 80% of our economy is service-based, right? Uh, and, and so the rest of it, a very small fraction of that, is manufacturing compared to service. And so because of that, a lot of people think we don't make stuff. Well, let, let's just see exactly what happens here. So I have a hyperlink of uh, U.S. exports here. Let's, uh, let's see what, uh, what we get. So in terms of um, exports, this is from the World Bank. Uh, let's compare the U.S., China, Japan, and Germany. Why? Because as, as you, you will have read from this uh, particular article, these are the top four exporting countries in the world. And, and if you look at, you know, going back to when this was tracked um, uh, for, for all four, uh, you could see that, you know, the, the things really start to pick up around 2000, right? And, and when you look at China, China really is number four up until right around here, 2004. And then around 2009, uh, China, uh, you know, surpasses uh, Germany, right? Uh, and, uh, and then after that, uh, again, China right around 2012 uh, it eventually uh, surpasses the United States. And so today, China is still the number one exporter on the planet as of 2000, uh, 2018, which is the latest recorded information from the World uh, Bank. Uh, and we, you know, so $2.6 trillion there and $2.51 trillion with the U.S. As you can tell, these are the two uh, you know, uh, most... Um, active exporters on the planet. Very much so, we trade and we make stuff. So there's that. Um, now, uh, what the author talks about, again, the question with this is a great question. Uh, why uh, are US exports so competitive? Not only do we export, but our exports are so competitive. Uh, one of the highlights of this particular chapter will be Boeing as a main export of the United States and its top rival Airbus out of Europe. And, uh, and so, you know, when you think about Boeing and, and the popularity of Boeing, and most years Boeing has been the number one uh, airline, uh, air, uh, uh, airplane manufacturer on the planet, there's been some years where Airbus has sold more. 
Uh, Boeing, uh, for example, in terms of value, remember the VRIO, value, rarity, inimitability, and organization. Uh, the Boeing Dreamliner uh, uses 15% less fuel uh, than its competitors. So there, there's that for value. In terms of rarity and inimitability, or if you want to call it imitability, that's fine, but hard to imitate. Uh, you know, again, except for Airbus, there's virtually no competition. Uh, and then organization, how you know Boeing itself is organized. And so here you have uh, strength in uh, operating services, training, and maintenance network. Uh, one of the statements from your author is that uh, uh, Xi Jinping, the premier of China, uh, Air Force One, if you want to call it that, the Air Force One, the Chinese Air Force One, is a Boeing airplane. Uh, and that's, that's a true, that is factual. What, what, is, what is also what I want to add to that is uh, what's interesting is that uh, it is not exclusively the premier's airplane. This airplane is actually used as a regular uh, fleet for passenger airline throughout the year, but when it, when it is used by Xi Jinping, then it is rearranged so that he can use it. So that, that's a difference there. All right, um, let's get into uh, the important terms related to trade. So first, uh, international trade is about exports and import, right? So that, that's all that means. Uh, what, what does it consist of? merchandise trade which really is about goods so these are the things that are tangible the products being uh, sold uh, and and bought right so that's this again that's all that means there and then of course service trade the intangible services uh, being bought and sold uh, so, so so you can export service as well just make sure that you understand that and so let's look at important again more important terms related to trade um, balance of trade. So now the question is, well, when you do look at imports and exports, uh, you start to ask yourself, uh, do we export more or do we import more, right? And you'll find out in this chapter that being really obsessive with that measure is, uh, is counterproductive. Uh, we're going to learn uh, that, um, yes, there, there's a a small fragment of uh, economists and uh, people out there who are uh, who believe that's the only way you should measure the economy but that's the minority uh, overall when we look at balance of trade uh, you look at it as a measure but you don't uh, most most um, I shouldn't say most but a lot of leaders throughout the world don't make policy based on that uh, so balance of trade whether you have a surplus or a deficit if you have a deficit, I added here, we call that a negative balance of trade. It's a balance of trade, it's negative, we call it a trade deficit. Again, what happens there is you bring in more stuff than you export. So that's a trade deficit. It just means your people are buying more stuff uh, than uh, from overseas than they're shipping overseas. Uh, a trade surplus is exactly the opposite. Uh, what I did here is I added uh, this article here from the New York Times. Uh, to kind of remind you that uh, Walmart's imports from China uh, here displaced uh, 400,000 jobs. And so when you see headlines like that, that's big, that's scary, right? Uh, Walmart is the number one importer of Chinese goods uh, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, and so when you look at Walmart's Chinese imports, they amount for at least $49 billion of the 200, uh, 2013 uh, year, according to a study uh, based on trade and labor data. Overall, the U.S. trade deficit with China was at uh, $324 billion that year. And so when you look at what that meant, it meant that Walmart alone was responsible for 15% of that trade deficit. We'll explore that a little bit more as we go. And some people, uh, again, will stop there and they'll say, that's just horrible, that's bad. Uh, you know, I, I want to I don't want to buy Chinese products, I want to buy American products, and that's all great, but most people are not willing to pay extra for that, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, let's see, uh, now moving along, now that we've talked about that, and we're talking about two key items, right? Again, I'm on page 68, why do nations trade? Uh, that's where we're starting. Uh, if you go to page 69, uh, you will see uh, a chart uh, that your author has, and uh, it's uh, from the World Trade Organization comparing uh, world trade growth over GDP growth uh, for the world. 
Uh, I, I, again, uh, I wanted to make sure that I kind of brought it up to speed. Obviously, uh, you know, since the book was printed, uh, things have changed. And so, uh, you know, year to year going from 1990, it's just fascinating to see what's been going on here. So you have the world trade volume growth uh, in blue and world GDP growth in red. And you can see that, you know, most of the time, world trade exceeds world GDP growth. It outpaces growth. And when you see more world trade exceeding growth, then you will see the ratios going up, right? And so um, I, I hope that makes sense, right? And when you have them on par, basically, like as you see right here around 2012, then your ratio is a ratio of one. Uh, when, and so, you know, that, that's where we are with, uh, with that uh, there. So, um, again, when, when you look at this, you, you look at 2010, 2011, and you could see the world trade volume really outpacing uh, world trade GDP growth, right? Uh, and uh, world trade GDP growth, uh, 09 uh, of, uh, over here, uh, really outpacing the uh, world trade volume growth, right? Uh, and, and you can see now things looking really dire here as, as you look at the biggest drop, which was a 6.3 ratio in 2009 uh, with world trade growth. So again, world GDP growth being higher than world trade growth. So that's what that is there. Uh, and um, you can see uh, where we are today, right? So the 2020, you can see everything dropping pretty dramatically and trade uh, dropping below GDP growth with ratios of 3653 uh, not too long ago we were just hovering around one so that's the update there uh, prior to that when the book was was published you know you, we could still say the world trade growth was outpacing uh, world GDP growth uh, so now let's talk about the need for international trade and by the way I have all my hyperlinks at the bottom of the slides if you want to see the updates uh, need for international trade right so the the, the resource-based view, when you ask the question, what's the need, is that firms are in one uh, unique nation generate exports that are valuable. Again, we're following the whole VRIO. Uh, that's for the resource-based view. It, and, and again, we're here uh, stating that it's beneficial for foreign firms to import. Let me pause a little bit here and remind you of something. When we're talking about world trade and we're talking about countries, remember this. We're not talking about officially countries trading with each other, right? Uh, yes, countries set policy. But we are talking about businesses. We're talking about mostly, uh, you know, a, a big chunk of it is multinationals, but, but it's businesses from one country trading with, with businesses, uh, with customers, I should say, from another country. And yes, sometimes the B2B with the businesses or the B2G business to government. Uh, and so when, when we talk about countries trading, I want to make sure that you, you do think about of course, we're not talking about countries trading per se. We're, we're talking about um, uh, companies exporting uh, to uh, maybe distributors or, or uh, other companies that buy uh, or directly to consumers, right? That's trade. Uh, and uh, the institution-based view, and again, remember every single chapter will always look at the resource versus institution-based view. And, and the resource is almost going to, you know, always going to uh, direct you to the VRIO, right? So now for the institution-based view, we're looking at different rules governing trade that are designed to determine how gains are shared or not shared. The key here is both sides must have economic gains, right? And that's the theme. One of the themes here, when we look at trade, you'll see it at the center of page 70, is that international trade is a win-win game. It has to be, that's how it works. Uh, and so otherwise, of course, there's all kinds of mechanisms. Uh, the World Trade Organization is such institutional mechanism. What the WTO does, uh, we'll talk more about that later on, but since we'll talk about it a little bit in this lecture, what the WTO, the role of the World Trade Organization, is an arbitrator. And so if a country is not playing fair about something with trade, uh, you file your complaint to the WTO, it investigates, and it has a ruling. And since your trading member maybe is you know, probably a WTO member, 
then uh, that country has to um, then comply with whatever the penalty is assessed by the WTO. So uh, moving along, uh, let's look at uh, the, now into the, the theories of trades, right? So we're starting on page 70, and remember we're breaking into two theories of trade, right? And we're going with the older theories and the more recent theories. So let's start with the really old one, mercantilistic approach or mercantilism. And it's an interesting one because it holds that the wealth of the world is fixed, right? Uh, for that one, I mean, you're know, going way, way far back when countries uh, were really just measuring everything uh, in terms of their wealth, uh, but, you know, with gold and silver. That's kind of like how they measured things. So the idea is I'm going to export stuff. You're going to buy my stuff. You're going to pay me in gold and silver. Uh, and I'm going to keep the gold and I'm going to keep selling your stuff. That's how I'm going to measure wealth, right? Uh, basically, what, what you will learn here is Adam Smith uh, wrote The Wealth of Nation uh, in large part uh, to address that, right? So uh, nations that export more than an import will enjoy the net inflow of gold and silver and become richer. Uh, this might sound familiar to you, right? Import, uh, import bad, export good, right? You've heard that before. Well, that's because a mercantilistic approach is the ancestor of what we call today protectionism. And of course, if you need a refresher, protectionism is the idea that governments should actively protect domestic industries from import to promote export. Um, again, and this is, by the way, where there's just tons and tons of discussion out there about protectionism. What I want to make sure you guys understand is that you, I, I really want you to come into this class, and especially when you uh, take macro and micro econ, uh, I, I want you to be there to learn. Whatever you might have heard in whatever sources out there, you know, big headlines, big scary headlines about this, that. One of the reasons there's so much emphasis on China with this, um, with this particular chapter is because you know China's been the boogeyman in so many of uh, these publications. And not to say that China is entirely, of course, innocent. There are some things that, that are um, you know, uh, definitely a little bit alarming when it comes to trade. But um, what I want to make sure you guys understand is that we, we're, we want to look at the numbers. And we want to look at uh, what you will see uh, come out of econ a lot is unintended consequences, right? Uh, if I decide to do something like, okay, I want to help a local industry, uh, and um, this industry is an old industry, and uh, I notice that foreign competition is coming in, and because maybe uh, labor is cheaper over there, maybe they reinvested in more research and development that I've had in the past 30 years, and so they're better, they're just better and cheaper. And of course, Americans are going to want to buy their products because they're better and cheaper. But then I feel like, okay, maybe uh, I'm getting a lot of pressure from that industry. Uh, the lobbying group is, is, is breathing down my neck. Uh, I've been threatened as a leader of my party. And so I will cave and I will say, no problem. Here's what I will do. I'll slap a huge tax on these uh, foreign imports so that now they cost more than your domestic product. Problem solved, right? Well, not so fast. The problem now is that you as a consumer, whether you want to or not, are going to buy the domestic product, which is great for the American workers that work in that industry. That's great for them. And so you, you might save those jobs for sure, at least in a short term. But uh, what happens is that you all of a sudden have less disposable income. It's costing more. And the product might be inferior, not because we're horrible, but because obviously if somebody's better at it, we haven't specialized. And so what happens is that when you start to do that and you start to really affect people's disposable income, uh, other industries will suffer. Their purchasing will go down, it will drop. It affects the macro purchase in, in the country. So again, I just want you to come into this lecture and really think and just think about unintended consequence, even of good intentions. Uh, the other thing we'll learn is that for the most part, uh, 
any type of uh, barriers that you put on imports to the United States, for the most part, are almost entirely political. They're never economic. They're political, uh, politically no motivated. And, and so we'll talk about that. All right, so let's get started uh, uh, with the mercantilistic approach uh, continued. Uh, so tariffs, uh, you know, in terms of uh, a country ranking, uh, I, want, I want you to kind of think like, okay, so how do we rank, right? So the World Bank tracks the stuff. Um, I wanted to share this with you just so you kind of think about the United States and how are we compared to other nations in terms of how much we tax uh, you know, uh, uh, goods coming into uh, the United States. You know, what, what do you think happens here? So um, here's what that looks like. Again, this is from the World Bank. And so when you look at uh, so far, look at look how things have changed since, you know, well, 1994. So 1994, the world had assessed, uh, you know, the, the rate was at 8.57. And look at how it's dropped. And basically, what does that mean? It made things more affordable around the world. Every time you have a tariff, what you're doing is you've created an artificial tax. It's, it's adding no value, right? The VAT, value added tax, this is not one of them. You just made things more expensive and that's it. So let's, let's see here uh, who's at the top. These are the countries ranked by who has who who assesses the most tariffs for whatever reason? Uh, obviously, the years change because countries will report things differently uh, by different year depending on how they report. Uh, and so so far, you know, you know, you're, you're you're talking about a lot of smaller countries, right? Definitely, I don't see any trillion dollar economies anywhere here so far. Uh, and by the way, on the right, you will look at and you will see. Who is, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, Republic of the Congo, uh, uh, you'll see that they've dropped. Others, uh, Senegal is going up. So they're assessing more tariffs than they used to. And so maybe there's a trade war going on here with the neighbor. Uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, not to be confused with the Congo, uh, you know, looking like they've dropped as well. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is going up. Uh, you know, and so you could, it's really interesting to see uh, who is going up and who's down. But so far, unless I've missed any, I don't see any trillion dollar economies here uh, that are above the eight mark. Uh, and so again, you know, Brazil there, you know, now we're getting into a larger economy, if you will. Uh, and so uh, Argentina, uh, notorious for that. Look at Cuba, surprising, right? Anyway, so I wanted to, you know, you can mess with that on your own, uh, share, share, uh, share that when look at it. Um, Let's move on. So now we're, we're, we, we've started with mercantilistic approach, mercantilism, and now we're looking at the two biggies. And the biggest one here is, remember, an answer to mercantilism, right? Uh, I just mentioned him earlier. This is someone who wrote a book, a very famous book, basically to address mercantilistic approaches. And that person is Adam Smith. And Adam Smith here comes up with absolute advantage. Uh, and basically, he says under free trade, each nation gains by specializing in economic activities in which it is the most efficient producer. So he's advocating free trade, right? Uh, remember the invisible hand from your econ class, right? Where supply and demand meet. Those are the market forces. And, he, you know, he says with free trade, they'll determine the buying and selling of goods and services. If people want it, they'll buy it. If they don't, they won't. And so um, importers will have to decide how they're going to price things and how they're going to do things. And if it's not good quality, it's not going to happen. So again, it's a, it's a very, you know, the, the, the term you might remember from your econ class is laissez-faire, right? French for uh, let it be. Um, and so there's little or no government uh, intervention here uh, with that. And so the idea is, you know, in fact, what he had, um, if I remember, it was, uh, I believe, uh, wool, right? So the UK, England, was really good at producing wool, and Portugal is good at producing wine. And so the idea is that, well, England should focus on wool, and uh, Portugal should focus on wine. Now, in this particular example, uh, you know, in fact, the author points out there's no such thing as English wine. It's an interesting thing. Uh, because, you know, again, when this was written, 
uh, this this book, which is not that old, uh, you know, it's a couple years old. Uh, it's it's true that there was really no uh, such thing as a wine industry in England. If you Google that today, you will see that there is not only a wine industry in England, but it is thriving. It is thriving, which is unheard of because England never had the climate for wine until now. Now, because of global warming, uh, England, for the first time in its history, is able to do what France has been able to do. And if you if you look at, at a map, you will see, of course, that it's 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 lower than England, um, on uh, closer to the equator, warmer climate. Uh, now, England's wine region, if you want to call it that, uh, it, it shares a very similar temperature than, than France had with its wine region. So so it's a, kind of a I thought an interesting little update that I would uh, throw in there. Um, and so here we go. So uh, you know, when 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 we're looking at the supply and demand curve for both, uh, in this case, the Chinese production and the U.S. production, the example is is wheat, right? So wheat over aircraft. And as you can see, uh, Chinese production of wheat is greater, and American production of aircraft is greater. And so if they trade, this is you know, it shows you if they go you know and trade a little bit of both, how much they lose. If they focus on one how much uh, they, they, uh, they get to, to have. Uh, so the best way to, to understand how this works is for us to just, you know, first we're assuming that a unit, the total units of resources for each country is 800 unit of resources, right? And so if we look here, focus on, you know, well, you have one through five, you have wheat aircraft and the countries here. And so, you know, at first, what are the resources required? for 1,000 tons of wheat and one aircraft. So the ratio is 1,000 ton of wheat and one aircraft, right? So one aircraft, 1,000 ton of wheat. Uh, and so this is what your, your, your ratio is gonna be here. And for 20 resources uh, to 80 resources here, uh, China would have 20 resources of wheat uh, and uh, 40 resources for an aircraft. So way much more resources for an aircraft, less resources for wheat. And the U.S. would need to have more resources for wheat and less resources for aircraft. So China is more efficient at wheat and uh, the U.S. is more efficient at aircraft. So here's the deal. What's production and consumption with no specialization and without trade? So they each devote half of their resources to each activity, right? And so here is what you have. The total production for wheat is about 25,000 ton for aircrafts is 30 between the two of them, right? And, and you can see for each how that plays out. But look at this. What are the gains from trade? What did they trade? And you can you know look at all the numbers. By the way, we're not running the ratios. The proper way to do this is to run through ratios uh, because we'll see that when we do comparative advantage, the ratios are gonna make a lot more sense. Um, and so the gains from trade is an increase in consumption as a result of specialization and trade. So in this case, you see that China gains uh, by trading uh, uh, with a 10,000 extra tons of wheat, and the US 5,000 tons of wheat and 10 aircraft. Uh, and so again, that's the gain from trade. Uh, now, let's, th so that was Adam Smith. Uh, David Ricardo came on later on to basically prove him wrong, where he said, hold on, let me give you the ultimate example, and then I'll talk about this in just a second. He says a nation gains by specializing in production of one good in which it has comparative advantage to another, right? So comparative advantage is a relative advantage in one activity that one nation enjoys in comparison with other nations. The best way to discuss that or exemplify it is by going and saying that first, their uh, net gains are availed through trade. Uh, there's an opportunity cost that, you know, in fact, I always use you guys as going through this opportunity cost now. You're giving up time maybe working somewhere by taking this class, right? Uh, I use this example usually when we're face-to-face -face and when everybody's sitting in a classroom and for an hour and a half, they're, they're going to be there. And I ask, how many of you are giving up time working right now? And most people raise their hands. And so the question becomes, what makes it okay? What kind of calculation did you make to decide you will not earn, what, 15, 20 bucks an hour, and you're, you're willing to forego that to be sitting here 
And, uh, you know, just when I think they're going to say it's because my lectures are brilliant, instead they usually say it's because of uh, the uh, degree, what, you know, they will make more money, they will be able to use their time in the future to generate more income by virtue of being educated and having a degree. That's the opportunity cost. So it's a, it's a long-term calculation, right? It is counterintuitive because um, it's realistic and useful during application uh, and in this particular case. And by the way, counterintuitive, I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. On the face of it, it looks like it makes no sense at all. It's absolute and comparative advantage arise from productivity, right? And so that's, that's the key here. It has to do with productivity. And this is, by the way, uh, where the ratios would really come in. Absolute advantage deals with productivity difference. Um, let's see, still here uh, with, with that, uh, comparative advantage emphasizes relative productivity difference, so relative to the other one that you have. You have to also look at factor endowment, the extent to which different countries possess uh, various factors of production, labor, land, technology. We'll circle back to that later on uh, when we look at uh, Michael Porter with the diamond theory, by the way. Uh, it's, a, it's a strategic tool that is used by Harvard professor uh, Michael Porter at, uh, that's uh, very useful. Uh, the uh, factor endowment theory, nations will develop comparative advantage based on locally abundant factors. Uh, you know, Middle East, oil, etc. So now, remember that when we look at absolute advantage, what we said was, well, it's kind of easy, right? Because we said China's going to focus on wheat and they're more efficient at wheat and the U.S. is more efficient at aircraft manufacturing. Easy. Done. But now, let's do it a different way. What if, what if, in this particular example, U.S. production is just better at both, right? So the question is, if the U.S. were better at producing aircraft, better meaning more efficient, less resources per unit, and that it's also better at producing wheat. However, the ratios of input to output in terms of resources for the U.S. is not the same, right? This is where it, got, it, it becomes really interesting. We're not saying that, um, whereas earlier when we were talking about absolute advantage and we were talking about uh, unit of resources, and we were talking about, let's see, uh, 800 unit of resources, and we were calculating how much uh, resource per aircraft, for example, right? I think it was 20 for the US and maybe 40 for China. Here, you're comparing the US to itself, and you have to calculate in which of the two areas is it going to be more efficient against itself, and whether or not it should then focus on one of its own area, even though the second is still more effective, efficiently produced than uh, its Chinese counterpart. So let's see what that looks like. Again, uh, you know, at the top, th there's going to be absolutely uh, no difference here compared to uh, what we did before, right? So um, now, and at the, uh, when you start to look at what happens at step two, production and consumption with no specialization and without trade. Okay, here it is. Earlier here, uh, for wheat, we had uh, 25,000 tons. Now we have 11,000. And for aircrafts, we had 30, so we're still at 30. So we remember that things have changed a little bit for the United States. I'm sorry, uh, I, I, let, me, let me correct myself. Uh, for wheat here in this particular example, because now, uh, the, uh, the U.S. is more efficient, we have 80 resources for China, right? Earlier, remember, China had 20 resources. And uh, for aircraft, nothing's changed for China. Uh, but the U.S. now uh, has 64 resources, whereas earlier it had uh, 80 resources, right? And um, so, again, remember that in this particular example, uh, the U.S. uses less resources than China, both for wheat and aircraft. So, 64 resources for one uh, unit of production of wheat and 20 resources for one unit of production for aircraft. So, something to be considered here, right? More efficient at aircraft production. And so, now we go back to uh, number three. 
So what does it look like production with specialization? I'm sorry, let's go to number four. Consumption up to China trades 4,000 tons of wheat for 11 aircrafts while producing at point E and C respectively. Uh, and so again, E and C, right? So here we go. There's point E and there's point C. So that's China. Uh, and so what do we get here? We get a total consumption of 12,500 tons uh, for wheat and 32 aircrafts. But look at trade. The gains from trade, just when you think it is absolutely impossible that the U.S. would benefit from trade with China since China is less efficient. It depends what the focus is for the U.S. And so if the U.S. does give up some trade with China by specializing in some and not others, then you're looking at plus 1,000 tons of wheat for China and 250,000, uh, sorry, 250 tons for the U.S., but both gain from one aircraft. Again, what, what I'm not doing here for you is we're not going through the ratios. You'll do that in econ. But I just want to make sure that I make the case that even though on the face of it, this looks completely counterintuitive and it would make absolutely no sense for the U.S. to trade with a country that's not as efficient, as long as its unit of production with one industry compared to another of its own internal industry, that unit production is more efficient in one than the other, you find the right ratio to give up one for the other and it, they both benefit from trade. All right, so let's now go on to uh, the third uh, theory of international trade here with the product life cycle. So uh, by the way, we're still looking at the oldies over here, right, uh, with the, the pro the, the, this uh, particular area. So product uh, life cycle here, uh, I'm sorry, we're moving on, we're moving on. I, I, I apologize. Uh, this is not the classical theory. Now we're getting into uh, the more modern theories. And so uh, uh, developed by uh, Raymond Vernon. And what he does here, it's a pattern of trade of change over time as production shifts and products move from new to maturing to standardized uh, uh, stages. It's called a dynamic, it's a dynamic theory, the product life cycle theory. Uh, you know, it divides the world into three categories, right? So over here, uh, we, you know, we have the US and then we have other developed countries and then we have developing countries. So literally, the US is, is part of one of the ways we're going to split the, wor the world in three parts. Um, it, you know, the leading innovation nation and then, you, so, so that's the US over here. Uh, developed nations is in the middle and developing nations at the bottom. And so it's, it's interesting what he does here, right? Uh, what he does uh, with, with this particular model is um, he, um, when you look at the trade volume for the United States, right, and you start to look at imports over exports, and you look at production, so when you look at that first new product phase over here, if the U.S. is the innovative country in this particular case, production is greater than consumption, right? So think about supply exceeds demand. If supply exceeds demand, what should you do? Well, you take that yellow chunk over here and that becomes your export. Export where? Export to other developed countries. So notice what's happening over here. You've started, you're kind of increasing with your production. Over here, production is very, very low with the new product. So what's happening is that gray area is the other developed countries' imports of the United States exports. And so that's happening for new product phase and maturing product phase, right? It's happening here where in this, U in this case the U.S. benefits uh, by being the innovative country and exporting the goods or service that is the innovative good and service. Uh, what happens is that by the time you hit the third uh, stage here, the standardized product, this is what we've talked about before with commoditization. Uh, your product becomes commoditized, and or there's a risk of that. And what happens is right here, it becomes interesting. Right here, it doesn't pay for these producers to really go on when, uh, with comparative advantage, they're better off here uh, you know, people realize that there's a product from another developed country that they can have access to. So now you're starting to import. Notice that your industry is still out there 
uh, you know, with uh, manufacturing in terms of consumption, but the production goes down, right? So you, ter you see that production go down in terms of manufacturing. It gets picked up by other developed countries, but also at the tail end by developing countries. So now, this is a um, you know, pretty straightforward model, a little bit of controversy. Uh, so the theories of international trade, uh, this criticism, because it makes an assumption. And the assumption is that the US uh, you know, holds the permanent position as lead innovator uh, for new products. So what I did here is just a quick uh, screenshot. This is from Bloomberg. Uh, the link is over here below. And it shows you that, um, you know, according uh, to, again, uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, coming from uh, the uh, monetary, uh, sorry, the labor, uh, International Labor Organization, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, all of the data coming from all these supranational organizations. Uh, and that's the, the U.S. actually ranks ninth in terms of innovation. And uh, Germany, uh, when this came out, uh, this is for 2020, by the way. Uh, Germany ranks number one in the world. Uh, South Korea, uh, number two. Singapore, number three. And and so you know you you know it might be surprising to some, right? Uh, Switzerland's number four. Sweden five. Uh, Israel six, seven. Finland, Denmark eight. U.S. ninth, and France is at ten. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, maybe a little bit humbling, but uh, come on, are you really surprised? You know, uh, the U.S. doesn't hold uh, a, uh, uh, a beacon when it comes to innovation throughout the world and more and more other countries are spending a lot more attention on research and development. And they're hiring uh, uh, scientists from all over the world. Uh, there uh, is a lot of publication out there. Actually, a lot of research has been done about immigration policy. And in the recent years, uh, the, uh, the United States has uh, changed its immigration policy. So a lot of uh, Nobel Prize winning research and scientists are, are taking their talent outside of the U.S., which, uh, you know, other countries will benefit from. All right. So uh, the stage by stage migration of product that takes longer duration is another assumption that is, a, you know, uh, not really a, a correct assumption to make. So uh, now, moving along, we're getting into still the more modern uh, uh, strategic trade, uh, trade theories. Um, so the other second one is the strategic trade, right? So strategic government intervention in certain industries uh, to enhance the odds for international success for these particular industries. And so, you know, you've heard of the, you know, solar, for example. Solar famously uh, when... Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the so back going back a little bit, Jimmy Carter, actually, President Jimmy Carter way back, uh, wanted to make a statement. And he uh, mounted solar panels on the roof of the White House because it was, you know, when we're coming out of the 70s, we're into the 80s here, and uh, you're talking about uh, oil dependence from the Middle East, uh, oil crisis in the U.S., etc., and so he's, he's initiating a conversation about renewable, and the government is uh, subsidizing, if you will, that effort in terms of more and more solar. I mean, you know, it, it shouldn't be a political uh, issue to just think about using energy from the sun, right? We put a panel on the roof, and the sun wakes up every morning, <laughs> goes around the earth. It's pretty reliable. Yes, clouds are the whole thing, but now we can store that energy. Well, Reagan uh, took them down, right? So Reagan got elected. And, and by the way, uh, not being ideological with my statements, they're just factual. Reagan took him down. Uh, and it took up until Barack Obama was elected to the White House that he brought them back on top of the White House. And he wanted to make that policy, uh, again, a policy. So, you know, there was a lot of criticism that the White House should not be subsidizing uh, these solar companies. And some went bankrupt, uh, while he was president, so that was a lot of bad press. The government is not in the business of choosing uh, which innovation is going to work. There's validity to that. Uh, the flip side is there's going to be risk involved. And if you're not doing it, the question becomes, are your competitors, your foreign competitors doing it? Is China subsidizing the industry? Is India subsidizing the industry? So when you look at solar today, 
and you look at you know the origin where solar panels come from uh, you know uh, my, my recollection and from the research that I've read is that China and India dominate so you you can look at you know the example another the example that your author is using is uh, you know aerospace industry again going uh, with the highlight of Airbus versus Boeing right in this case uh, pro, you know the strategic trade policy uh, is such that when Airbus uh, in the I believe it was in the 60s 70s when four European countries got together and said we need to you know they already had a space program they're already you know sending satellites into orbit and they have rockets and they have airplanes and they thought why don't we make a commercial airplane between all of us so they called that company Airbus today Airbus is the only competitor uh, to Boeing direct competition and so how did that come about well let's let's go into it uh, in this particular case uh, the European government subsidized Airbus uh, so that it could eventually compete with Boeing. What's the criticism? Well, the criticism I talked about, scholars and policymakers are uncomfortable with government intervention. What if the government makes, you know, a bad bet? Or, you know, what are we betting on? Is it, is it, uh, quote unquote, clean coal? Is that where, where the money is going? Or is it going on some other renewable? Which renewable do you like? Um, and so industries claim they're strategically important. And so they'll be, in this case, they'll go to whoever's in the White House and uh, seek protection. And protection in this case means uh, being subsidized. Just so you know, a subsidy is a trade barrier. I want to make sure you understand that. A government subsidy is a trade barrier. And we'll talk more about that as we go into trade barriers. Uh, so let's see what it looks like. Uh, this is, uh, in this case, we're looking at a scenario for what happens without government subsidies between Airbus and Boeing. In this case, it would be Airbus that's getting the subsidy versus Boeing not getting the subsidy, right? And so you have Airbus here on the left, you have Boeing at the top, and if uh, neither company decides to enter the market, well, they're both out $5 billion, no harm, no foul. Uh, in this particular case, what if uh, one enters and the other doesn't. Well, in this case, uh, if Airbus decides to uh, stay out, Boeing enters. Congratulations, Boeing. You're, in this case, getting the $20 billion. Uh, and uh, what if it's the other way around? What if Airbus enters and Boeing sits out? Boeing gets nothing. If neither enters, then neither gets anything. So again, if both compete, uh, we're looking at a negative $5 billion dollar uh, loss in terms of you know cost of research and development, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right, and so that's that's what's happening here. Now let's look at the next slide. For the next slide, we're going to add a new element. That element is with subsidy. What if the European governments give Airbus a ten billion dollar subsidy? Well, let's see what happens. Remember what we talked about before, and so. Over here, if Airbus enters and Boeing enters, remember the previous slide, they both lost $5 billion when they decide to compete with each other. But now you got $10 billion amortized. So instead of a negative five, you get a positive five with that 10 billion. So both enter, and in this particular case, uh, Airbus is ahead of the game. Well, and what if Boeing decides I'm gonna sit this one out? Well, you know, in this case, you get that 20 plus 10, that's 30, right? And of course, if Airbus sits out, nothing changes for Boeing. So that's, you know, a way of looking at the effect of a subsidy. Uh, and so now moving along with uh, national competitive advantage of industries, uh, there's competitive advantage of certain industries in different nation that depends on uh, four aspects. And I talked about him below. Uh, before, right? So that's the diamond shape of Michael Porter, right? Um, and so it's called the diamond theory. And uh, basically, this is what it looks like. And so we're on page 76, by the way. And your author really does a great job here with a lot of the examples uh, from uh, from what we've been talking about so far, right? And so when as, as you follow this on um, page 70, and you look at, first of all, uh, the factor endowment, right? So, um, get my pointer here. Uh, so, when we, we're right here, the, the country factor endowment and what that entails, which refer to the natural and human resources, 
noted by the Heckscher Olin theory. You learned that in econ. Uh, some countries, such as Saudi Arabia, are rich in natural resources but short on population, where, uh, while others, such as Singapore, have well-educated population but few natural resources. So not surprisingly, Saudi Arabia exports oil and Singapore exports semiconductors because they need abundant skilled laborers. So that's an example of the country endowment, right? Uh, it's almost, some say, it's almost a, a long-term strategic disadvantage to rely uh, and be lucky maybe on a natural resource because you might get lazy, right? I mean, if you want to see something interesting, uh, you know, go back uh, to uh, our resource that we've been using in this class, uh, 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 the uh, MIT Economic Complexity, and, 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 and look at the GDP for Venezuela and look at exports for Venezuela and how much of oil the country relies on just to pay the bills. Uh, and, and again, some people might say that, you know, maybe you thought you were blessed with oil, but your over-reliance on this natural resource has been your undoing, of course, with, you know, questionable uh, policy uh, in government. Okay, so uh, second, we're, we're looking at now uh, across here at domestic demand condition which propels firms to new heights. Uh, why are American movies so competitive worldwide? Uh, well, it's because of extraordinary demand uh, from the U.S. markets. And so in this case, the domestic demand condition have really helped in terms of, um, you know, uh, 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 the keeping industries competitive across the board. Uh, and then, uh, so that's for domestic demand condition. Uh, moving along then to uh, your... Uh, related and supportive industries uh, provides the foundation upon which key industries can excel. And without strong related and supporting industries such a, as the engines of avionics or material and aerospace, you can't uh, you know, be uh, a, 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 an airline industry. Uh, and this is exemplified by your author here again on page 76 where uh, he lets us know that you know, Europe got a, 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 an early start, right? Uh, when Europe decided to invest in Airbus, we're talking about the 70s, 60s, 70s, when the decisions were made, and that's why Airbus is, is out today. It, it's taken a while. And so we, we learned that um, now you have uh, Chinese, Korean, Japanese aerospace have tried to compete, but not going to happen. I mean, at least not in the short term, uh, maybe in the long term, maybe, but um, definitely uh, late entrance to the game. Um, and so uh, lastly, of course, uh, when you look at the firm strategy structure and rivalry, think about what we've talked about all along, right? The VRIO uh, and how the country, uh, the, the, the company is set up. What is the structure of it? The structure of rivalry. And this is where it gets to be really, you, we'll, we'll, we'll do more of that when we get into strategy down the line. Uh, okay, so now moving along here, uh, let's see. Uh, it's considered as a revolutionary theory when the world was dominated by uh, mercantilistic uh, thinking, right? When you look at uh, where we are today, relies, uh, again, the classical theories of international trade, right? They rely on simplistic assumption of a model consisting usually of two nations and two goods. I mean, just think, global trade was not a word that existed back then. You didn't have a multinational. You didn't have a, you know, a company like Nestle that has a, a global footprint as one of the biggest food companies on the planet, uh, you know, but with a teeny tiny percentage of sales in its own country of origin. I mean, that there's no other better way of looking at a multinational corporation than when you, you know, more than 50% at least of your revenue comes from outside your country. And not just from one country, by the way. Uh, it assumes perfect resource mobility. And so again, it doesn't take into consideration uh, cost of uh, shipping, distribution, etc., and assumes that there are no foreign exchange rates and zero transportation costs. Right. So it, you know, this is where you you you'll be exposed to the the zero sum game. Right. Zero sum game is uh, uh, the idea that uh, uh, there are just uh, everything that we're measuring is very much finite. Uh, all right. So what are the realities of international trade uh, in terms of uh, now we're getting into trade barriers. Uh, very important component, uh, uh, you know, in this particular case of this chapter, trade barriers. Uh, and so 
look at the two words, you know, uh, uh, the tariff barrier, a tariff barrier. Uh, really, what we should have, we should have this whole section called just what, it, what they are, right? Uh, trade barriers. And as we think about trade barriers, just think of a literal barrier. This thing is erected, is designed to slow down trade for usually protectionism. And so it discourages import, in this case a tariff, uh, to make it easier for you, a tariff is a tax, right? And so it makes it, it discourages import by placing a tariff or tax on imported goods. Uh, an, import, an import tariff is a tax imposed on imports. Uh, I, I, I you know, wanted to share this with you, your author talks about it, the rice tariff of Japan, where Japan is desperate to really uh, protect its rice uh, industry, which, you know, when you look at demand for rice in Japan, uh, it, it cannot be met by supply. And so, you know, it, imports are necessary, but there was a 778 tariff on, uh, on, on, on rice that uh, Japan imposed on all imports. Uh, a deadweight cost is a net loss that occur in an economy as a result of tariffs. Uh, if you think about just that, if, if, if you know you have a, uh, a car and that car is imported to the US from another country and there's, all of a sudden the government decides to impose a tariff on the car. And now there's uh, that car that you were you know, saved for, etc. cost an extra $2,000. Uh, you might decide, well, I don't know what happened, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to drive my old car for a while. That's a deadweight cost. The $2,000 is what's referred to as a deadweight cost. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I know I started the lecture by, by talking about those things. So let's talk about, the, we talked about tariff, and now let's talk about the non-tariff barrier. So the easiest basic uh, barrier is, is a tax. It's very simple. It's, you just decide you're going to ratify the policy the government makes a big announcement as of this date all goods coming from this country that are classified as xyz uh, will be subject to a 10 percent tariff boom done sometimes you you're, you're going to pick another vehicle as a barrier uh, maybe it's because you have a trade agreement maybe you uh, you both uh, have ratified a trade agreement and you agreed that you would never have a tariff so maybe you do something else. Remember, I told you earlier, a subsidy is a ter is a is, is a barrier, right? So you know, uh, if an American farmer is getting subsidized for, uh, you know, corn for something, and what it does is it does keep foreign corn at bay, right? Why? Because that American farmer artificially gets to keep the price of his corn low below a certain threshold, below a normal economic threshold, right? If we stick to supply and demand, we might decide we don't bought it, we don't, we're not going to buy that corn because that it costs too much for an American farmer to make that corn. So I'll buy it from somebody else. In fact, I might not buy corn at all. Look at ethanol. Uh, you know, ethanol in the U.S. is based on corn. And because the corn industry is subsidized, it's cheap to make uh, you know, actually, it's not cheap because of all the requirements to make ethanol, but um, it, it's cheaper to make ethanol with American corn uh, because the corn is subsidized. And, and you know, the largest producer of uh, ethanol in the world uh, is um, Brazil, right? So Brazil, up until recent history, was the largest producer of uh, ethanol because um, all cars in Brazil were run on ethanol, number one. Uh, number two... Uh, because ethanol, uh, Brazil makes its own ethanol. However, it has a better resource to make ethanol. And by better, I mean a resource that requires less with more calories to generate ethanol. Um, and that's uh, cane, right? Cane sugar is what's used in Brazil uh, for that. And so it would make a lot more sense to import ethanol from Brazil because we could get it way, way, way cheaper than American ethanol. But in this case, because of subsidies, we're keeping the Brazilian ethanol at bay and protecting uh, our farmers with these subsidies, which means you and I pay more uh, to protect those jobs. That is a barrier. We're keeping uh, other uh, uh, 
you know, farmers at bay. Uh, an import quota is just like it sounds. Uh, there was a recent import quota, at, I believe at the very beginning of the Trump uh, administration taking office on uh, my personal favorite uh, uh, item, which are avocados from Mexico. Uh, the uh, Mexican avocados is the, is the most uh, sold and traded avocados on the planet. I mean, by a factor of ridiculous. Like, we're talking 90% uh, uh, of all avocados on the planet come from Mexico. Uh, there's a really cool chart out there if you want to Google it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, 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 was a very, it wasn't very long-lived, but for, for a while there was a quota placed on uh, Mexican avocados coming in from Mexico. Uh, voluntary export restraint is, is fascinating. And just as it sounds, it's when uh, a country uh, decides that it's, you know, okay, fine, fine, I'll export less to your country. Uh, I understand, Japan, that, you know, you have this barrier here on rice, and maybe uh, I will just come in with, with less, right? Uh, so, you know, again, uh, in fact, uh, let me give you a better example, which is the example that your author is using. Uh, and that had to do with uh, back in the 1980s, right? 1980s. Um, some of you love that music. Uh, and so 1980s, uh, Japan all of a sudden started out producing the U.S. in terms of car manufacturing. Uh, you'll learn a lot more about that when you take management with me. Uh, and we talk about uh, Dr. Deming, Dr. Duran. Uh, post-World War uh, to uh, uh, quality effort uh, in Japan that are exported by uh, American thinkers, by the way. So having, having said that, all of a sudden, uh, the, you know, the U.S. Is, is upset that uh, Japanese cars imported into the United States come in such vast numbers. They're cheaper, they're very reliable, and American uh, sales of cars start to go down. And uh, initially, um, what happens there is that the U.S. says to Japan, "We're going to slap tariffs on you. We're going to, we're we're going to, you know, hurt you, uh, so that you don't bring uh, those cars in." And that's when uh, Japan voluntarily, for a while, said, "Okay, hold on, hold on. We'll export less. No problem." Uh, you know, by the way, Japan found a very elegant solution to that that I'll talk about later on. Uh, so, local content requirement, uh, just as it sounds, again, is when you say, um, you know, uh, that the uh, when Japanese cars were were brought into the United States. Uh, you know, uh, some people found a way around to say like, oh, we'll have a factory in the U.S. That's what we'll do. That way we can't, you can't slap a tariff on me. You can't, uh, it, you know, uh, assess uh, a uh, non-tariff barrier on me because I'm making the thing here in your country. Uh, well, they, they, you know, they were kind of like being duplicitous here a little bit because some of these plants were, were referred to as screwdriver plants. And just as it sounds, basically all the material would come in boxes from another country uh, or and all you had to do here at that plant was like screw things in. So quote unquote, you could say they were made here, but the 99% of everything came from the other country. And so uh, that later on, we found a way, or, you know, to, to resolve that uh, with the 51% uh, Buy American Act, uh, which was again that uh, local content requirement, uh, you know, uh, law. Um, you know, uh, then then we're getting into the administrative policy. Uh, over here for that, we're, we're, there are di different mechanisms here. Uh, Argentine protectionism, for example, was fascinating. Uh, you know, if you, you, there, this is from Bloomberg. Uh, Argentine protectionism sees car swap for rice. And this is just a great article where these guys had like car dealerships. This is one particular guy here at a BMW. Uh, he was ex he had a bunch of BMW dealerships in uh, Argentina. And at the time, uh, 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 Kirshner, who was the president of Argentina, Christina Kirshner, uh, decided, I'll tell you what, you're not going to sell any cars in this country unless you help me uh, export rice, export olives, export wine. So these guys who are like in the business of just importing German cars to Argentina found that if they wanted to keep selling cars in Argentina, they're going to have to export goods uh, at the behest of Argentina. So that was an example of a, of a really just, I mean, extreme administrative policy. Uh, and then you have your anti-dumping uh, duty, right? So uh, this is where I thought, well, the best way to explain that is when you believe that a country is being, you know, has wronged you and, uh, you know, you, uh, you can actually um, complain to the WTO and take action and say, you know, we're going to uh, get you back. And so this is a, this is a really cool map. We'll, we'll, I'll use it more in this class later on. 
but it's a interactive map of disputes between uh, World Trade Organization members. And so, uh, you know, you could see, you know, uh, how many complaints, the more red, the more complaints, and uh, uh, the, the gray ones are, are countries uh, that, are, that are not members, right? So, uh, you know, uh, all the, everybody else is a member. So, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, I don't know, let's look at Argentina, get an update here, uh, Argentina v. US. So we've got, uh, you know, ground nuts. Uh, there we go, there's one. Anti-dumping on, on, on tubular goods from Argentina. So, so that would be one measure there uh, that um, in, in this particular case, the US uh, anti-dumping is a review of, of oil country tubular goods from Argentina. Uh, there's a complaint filed there, right? So uh, that's, that's giving you kind of an example here uh, about anti-dumping. There's an accusation uh, that Argentina is, uh, is selling these products, I don't know, below cost or something. Uh, what a lot of it has to do is with the steel tariff that the Trump administration uh, levied against just about everybody uh, in, in the world. Uh, all right, so moving along. Uh, so now we're, we're looking at these economic agreements. So should we go for free trade or not, right? So let, let's, let's look at that and, and see. I, I'll use an example from, from your author here on page uh, 82. Uh, really interesting little author. I mean, sorry, interesting little example about protecting domestic industries. And this one is about sumo wrestlers. And so if you look at page 82, there's a picture of a sumo wrestler. And, uh, you know, it's a, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, I don't know, maybe it might be a little bit embarrassing uh, for Japan. Uh, that up into, like, you know, the early 90s, uh, Japanese sumo top division tournament winners uh, were all Japanese. You know, you, you had one from the U.S. in 72. Well, you know, I think there's a movie about him. Uh, but, uh, you know, you get like right around the early 90s, more Americans coming in, but then American Samoa and then Mongolians, right? And Bulgaria, Estonia, Georgia. Uh, and so you're, you're seeing in this, you know, this is kind of an extreme example. It's a fun example, but uh, well, fun just because it shows globalization in a sport that's just been considered really Japanese entirely. Uh, and so, so it's just a, just a fun little example to show you that sometimes... Uh, their, their quote-unquote domestic industries. Probably a better example about, about that is uh, the um, uh, example of uh, Airbus, right? Uh, so when Boeing uh, started maybe hurting Airbus when it was still a very, very young industry, this is what we call the infant industry argument, uh, then it was okay for uh, the European countries to slap uh, barriers in terms of, of tariffs or quotas or whatever on Boeing coming to the U.S. because it would be unfair, right, to compete against an infant industry that is a domestic industry. So that's the first argument there. And the second argument is, well, I just kind of blended the two, right, uh, the, the infant industry. So uh, if, you look at, if you look at, you know, in this particular example that I have, uh, Recently, the U.S. won a $7.5 billion award in Airbus subsidies case. So the author here had this great example early on about the Airbus subsidy, right? Uh, and how Airbus has been subsidized by the European consortium for years. And, they, you know, in this case, the U.S. went to the World Trade Organization and the World Trade Organization agreed with the U.S. and said, there you go, you can collect $7.5 billion dollars uh, from the European Union, from the countries that are going to be named here uh, to get your money back, right? And so uh, in this particular case, uh, that's great for the U.S. So this, if you look at that story, that story came out 10-2-2019. Uh, well, a funny story with the picture that I have uh, over here is uh, a, about a year later, Airbus found a way around that, which is, okay, fine, fine, fine. We're not going to be European anymore. We're going to be American. Airbus officially opens an A220 product, uh, production facility in the U.S. The 220 is a very, very popular airplane uh, uh, with airlines in the United States, especially domestic airlines that fly within the U.S. I believe that the first uh, company uh, to uh, place orders, massive amounts of orders, was uh, JetBlue. Uh, and so in this case, by, by virtue of being American now, uh, you know, it's uh, shielded from that. Uh, so a little bit of an update on a really fun little example. Uh, all right, moving along. Uh, the political arguments against free trade. Uh, national security is always a big one. Uh, in fact, that's the argument that the, this uh, current uh, 
administration used uh, for the steel tariff. They said, you know, if there's a war, we need steel, and that's why we need to make our own steel. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. You know, that's, that's, uh, you know, sounds like a totally valid argument. Uh, the problem is that, you know, the biggest steel company in the U.S. is not a steel company. It's interesting. It's a steel recycler. Uh, it's called Nucor. They used to be called Mini Mills, and it doesn't even apply to Nucor anymore because it's no longer a mini. Uh, but it is, it is a company that uh, is the largest producer of steel in the United States uh, by way of recycling steel. So we don't really, uh, we don't really uh, make steel anymore in the U.S. Uh, we, we really recycle uh, the stuff, right? And so that's, you know, if you want to look it up, that's, uh, that's Nucor. Um, and so, uh, anyway, so what, what's going to happen there? Well, what happens is that other countries will complain to the World Trade Organization. The U.S. is, uh, you know, um, using the, the invalid argument for protectionism. And if the WTO agrees with the complainants, which will be the European Union, uh, Asia, uh, Latin America, uh, in fact, you know, even our top trade partners, Canada, Mexico, then, then we'll have to pay them back, right? And we'll pay them back in the same way that you see Europe paying us back uh, with the tariffs uh, that, in, you know, the, with the subsidies that it had on, on uh, Airbus. Uh, another one is uh, consumer protection. This, uh, this actually, actually, I remember this one happening oh, several years ago uh, with uh, dog food. Uh, there was a lot of dog food uh, coming in from China that was laced with uh, harmful uh, chemicals that made uh, you know, animals uh, sick or, or, or died. And for a while, we, we actually um, had um, uh, blocked uh, 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 animal food coming in from China until they were able to have uh, you know better uh, quality. Uh, trade intervention, so a trade embargo is trade intervention. There's lots of examples of that uh, Iran, Iraq, etc. Uh, that that the author is giving us, just as it sounds, it's trade intervention uh, and uh, environmental and social responsibility would be another political argument against free trade. So all of these things are reasons that are going to invoke uh, trade barriers, right? Uh, what are the factors that determine the success and failure of a firm's export? Again, a resource-based view. Uh, successful exports, you know, VRIO, we talked about that. We're recapping here. Uh, the institution-based view, laws and regulations promoted by special interest groups can protect certain domestic industries, firms, and individuals. I want to make sure you understand, very often, this is very short term. Uh, George Bush had a uh, you know, steel tariff, um, maybe similar to the one that uh, the, this current administration is, is using, imposing, and, and that really, that, that uh, steel tariff uh, backfired uh, in a massive, massive way. Uh, and it, ma it, it really um, backfired because it, it just created a monster. Uh, and by that monster, what I mean is uh, that that steel tariff, as we were slapping a uh, steel tariff on, on, uh, on, on the world, really, uh, then uh, this tiny, these companies uh, overseas uh, decided uh, that uh, they were going to band together, right? And that in this particular case, uh, they would, um, you know, there was a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and a lot of companies getting together, and uh, that that monster that I'm just you know referring to here that did not ex it did not exist uh, before uh, this tariff is ArcelorMittal, right? And so ArcelorMittal today, without a doubt, is uh, the biggest steel company uh, you know on the planet. Uh, there is no close uh, competitor. I always use the example of a marathon, and if you want to say yes, there's competition, I would say. Okay, well, ArcelorMittal finishes the marathon in two hours, and its number two competitor shows up a week later. Uh, if you want to call that competition, uh, you know, it's it's really uh, you know the numbers kind of tell you a little bit of everything here. Uh, but but this company did not exist at all actually before the steel tariff because there were there were two companies. Metal was a Indian-based company, uh, Lakshmi Metal, and Arcelor uh, Luxembourg. And, uh, to, you know, one made more high-end steel, the other one made a lot of construction, kind of a low-end steel, and now they're, they just dominate. And so I, I'm, I'm just kind of circling back to the notion that it protects certain domestic industries. Yes, steel companies had a level of protection during the tariffs. 
once the tariffs were lifted, they were wiped out completely, and very few survive, and they don't make steel, they recycle steel. Uh, it erects trade boundaries. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, quid pro quo here. So, well, if you're going to slap a tariff on me, I'll slap another tariff on you. And so, in, in the end, just uh, it, I want you to ask yourself, who, who suffers, right? Who suffers when you have countries slapping tariffs and trade barriers on each other? Well, obviously, the consumers are the ones that suffer. They have less choice. Uh, they have the quality goes down because you don't uh, get to have access to countries that specialize in goods that you used to buy. And of course, things go up in price because they don't specialize. So your disposable income goes down. It makes the nation as a whole worse off, right? So again, uh, that's what we've been talking about so far. Uh, what are the implications for actions? All right. Uh, discover is, uh, to discover and leverage comparative advantage of world-class location. And you know, that's why this thing is very dynamic. Uh, you don't just like move to another country and boom, we're done. Uh, you know, a lot of multinationals are, are constantly changing location of the factories because, you know, things change. Uh, you, you need to monitor and nurture your current comparative advantage of certain location, take advantage of new locations, and be politically active to demonstrate, safeguard, and advance the gains of international trade, which, by the way, uh, requires, you know, a lot of talking. And uh, that's you know, the thing about politics, too. There's, there's give and take, uh, you know, and uh, so... You know, just just food for thought. Uh, as we finish up this chapter, I want to you know to kind of give you a heads up on page uh, 84. Uh, that will be a big assignment for you that I have here: the closing case, the China trade debate. Uh, there's a there's a couple of things in the chapter that are really super interesting. On page 80, you have this uh, book that was well, it's a it's an in, in focus uh, highlight of a book that was written about a family that decided to only buy products made in China for a year, you can see how that went. Uh, and then page 78, another really interesting things, and, and perhaps page 78 is how I want to kind of end this slide here. Uh, Canada has been our best friend for years, right? Again, we talked about this. If you want to describe your best friend as your top customer, your top buyer, you know, the person that's reliable and has bought more goods from you over a period of long history than any other customers, right? I mean, you know, just think about how you should treat that customer. And uh, we haven't treated Canada very well. We, we were slapping, as I mentioned, lots of tariffs on Canada. And uh, there's a trade war going on with, with Canada. Um, and so put yourself in the shoes of Canada and ask yourself, uh, is it wise for Canada to only rely on the United States, right? Is it wise for them to put all their eggs in this one basket? And what, you know, that's the uh, ethical dilemma here, the debate on page 78, that maybe, um, as you'll learn here from the debate, that Canada is, uh, you know, closing in on a, on a trade deal uh, with the European Union, which would make it one of the biggest in the world. Uh, and so, and it's doing that and moving away from over-reliance on trade with the U.S. So you, you do lose by not playing well with others when you decide to just... Uh, you know, have kind of a unilateral, arbitrary policies. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you uh, sometimes embarrass other nations. Uh, it, it can backfire because um, in the end, uh, we just remember that global business is about interdependence. We are interdependent on each other. We do better when we communicate. And yes, if somebody takes advantage of us, there are tons of mechanisms for that. All right. Uh, again, as always, make sure you get your, you know, all of your key terms out of the way. Uh, you know, flashcards I recommend uh, for for your quiz. Uh, and once you've gotten your key terms out of the way, uh, make sure that, of course, you know, you've applied what you've learned, and that you have understood uh, with the concepts, um, so that you're ready for those application questions. And so that concludes this lecture. I, I, you know, really try to keep it under an hour. I can't. Not with, the, not with this chapter. As you can tell, we've switched gear, people. Uh, the next chapter is also going to be fascinating. It's about foreign direct investment. I can't wait to tell you about it. It's a really neat chapter. Uh, and I guarantee you uh, we'll learn a lot and hopefully, uh, you know, see things in a, maybe in a different way. That's the goal. Uh, all right. See you next time for chapter six.